Oh yeah, in this chapter we're going to talk, uh, kind of finish up the course at least, talk a little bit more about retirement. Uh, in this case, we're just going to talk about the structure. Um, the final chapter will be a little bit more on planning. Um, I think most of this information, uh, um, maybe not the details, but certainly the flavor of the information makes some sense to us. Uh, you know, about 72% of middle class Americans between the age of 25 and 69 figure they're going to have to work sometime during retirement. So retirement at 60, 65 is not a for sure thing. Uh, most of us are going to have to work a little bit longer maybe. So obviously the, the, the picture is not terribly bright um, unless we take actions early. Um, it's, it's obviously a, a, it's an important strategy, it's an important process for, for everybody to kind of start to work on. And again, the, as, as we've talked about throughout this whole course, the sooner you start the planning, uh, the better things will work for you. Retirement obviously has four steps to it. You have to figure out what your pre-retirement expenses are going to be and then figure out what your standard of living is going to be based on based on your monthly retirement expenses. Um, once we understand what our expenses are then we have to look at what income we expect to receive from all the sources that we have and then of course if we have a shortfall we have to figure out how to fix that. So the key sources of retirement income is any kind of a government sponsored plan Social Security, corporate retirement plans, personal retirement plans, personal taxable investments uh, outside of retirement uh, tax deferred kinds of vehicles, and then of course um, an alternative obviously is re employment during retirement. So the ultimate planning, here we have we have our pre-retirement expenses and what is typically true for most of us is that your expenses after you retire are less than they were before they retire. Again, if you think about it in general, uh, hopefully your house is paid for, um, you know, the kids are gone, yada, yada, yada. You know, the expenses are just less. Um, some expenses may actually increase, though. Health care is a huge expense we may have to worry about during our retirement years or at least until you get to uh, um, Medicare benefit time uh, when you can plug into some of those government resources. So here are our sources of income and then of course at the end here here's this income shortfall that we have to worry about. That's the part of the planning that we ultimately have to uh, uh, try to get a hold of earlier rather than later. Social Security is, uh, I'm sure everybody is least familiar with it since we all pay into it. Essentially, the vesting rules is you need four, 40 quarters of credit in order to be uh, fully vested or fully insured in the program. So, uh, again, uh, only if, again, you can only do four credits. Essentially, it's based on quarters, obviously. So you can only do 40 credits in a, in a calendar year. So, for instance, if you had two full-time jobs, you couldn't get eight credits a year for both jobs. You can only get a maximum of four. Uh, the earliest you can get is age 62. Your monthly income is going to be based on several factors. And again, there's no age restric restrictions for payments due to things like disability or death. So, again, we have to... Um, incorporate the concepts of Social Security. Now again, most people say, well, you know, are, is Social Security going to be there? I believe in one, in one version or another, Social Security will be there, but how much will be there, and not necessarily even how much will be there, but how much that assists you in your um, spending patterns during retirement, that's really the big key. So now we have what is your full-time retirement age and again currently 
since uh, most of us in this room are are uh, um, um, born after 1960 um, or thereabouts, it's 67 years old. For some of us who are a little bit later, guess what? I get an extra, or I get my full retirement status is actually 10 months sooner than everybody else. So again, the, the net effect is, depending on when you are, there's only really two years total difference between what anybody is going to be able to do as far as uh, being eligible for full retirement. How you calculate taxation of securities benefits is actually, um, it's kind of a painful exercise. Um, we need to know what your benefits are going to be for the year. Again, you go through this pattern and they down below here they have these tiers. The top part here says how much is going to be subjected to taxes and you use this first tier threshold. Um, if that provisional income, if line four up here, wherever that is, right, if that's not, uh, doesn't exceed the first tier, if that's not bigger than $32,000, then there's no taxation. But if it exceeds that, then you have to continue this and see if you fall into this second tier threshold. So again, it's a complicated formula to see if ultimately if your Social Security uh, benefits are taxable. Well, here's ultimately the, the, the question. The question is going to be, is your income going to be taxable when you get to retirement? Or is your tax rate going to go up or is your tax rate going to go down? Right? Probably won't necessarily go up unless the tax rates themselves go up. But here's the, here's the point that I'm trying to make with this, is that uh, unlike your grandparents and maybe great-grandparents, right, my father doesn't pay taxes. He doesn't have enough income in order to get to a taxation point. What's different from his income and possibly your income is the amount of income that he needs. When you get to retirement, you're going to need more income. Where does your income come from? Typically, there's two sources, Social Security and some type of a retirement plan. Well, unless you do some uh, um, Roth types of investments, etc., all of your income that you take out is ultimately going to be taxable. So if you need $30,000 a year or $40,000 to live on in a year, all of that income, most of that income, is going to come from 401k types of activity and all of that income is taxable. So your tax burden uh, probably won't be incredibly diminished. Let's put it that way. It probably won't go up, but it certainly won't go down all that much. In other words, most of us won't live tax-free during retirement times. That will have a tremendous impact on Social Security and how much of Social Security is taxable. We talked about normal retirement, currently now 67. Um, benefits are also extended to spouses and children. Again, a maximum of 50% should you die. Half of your benefit ultimately goes to them. If you uh, are uh, children and spouse, um, should you die uh, prior to this time, then um, Social Security has a payment that can go to your underage children and your spouse to help cover some of, of, of their needs. There's a disability benefit that's paid through uh, Social Security. One of the things we do have to be a little bit concerned about is the definition of disability. It is a very strict definition. Basically it says, do you have an inability to work? It has no definition of what work is. So if you're a surgeon, right, and uh, you become disabled, uh, Social Security will say, well, wait, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you could uh, flip burgers at McDonald's. Right? You, you're not physically unable to flip burgers at McDonald's. So if you could flip burgers at McDonald's, you can work. So the disability may not kick in 
for you. It has to be somebody who has a disability to work, period. Um, obviously, the health insurance pieces are the Medicare programs. We talked a little bit about that in the uh, chapter on insurance. But we need to switch gears now and start talking a little bit about retirement plans. Essentially, here's what here's what we know about these plans. The plans are referred to as being qualified plans. A qualified plan means that your company can deposit money from their accounts as part of your benefit, and they can also take money from your pre paycheck pre-tax and deposit that into an account. And then that count, account grows on a tax deferred basis. So we offer tax advantages to both the employer and the employee. The employee gets less taxes now, they get income later, and of course the employer gets to deduct the amount that they input into the, uh, into the retirement plan. They get to deduct that. There are two definitions. We have to segment our employees into highly compensated employees and non-highly compensated employees. Essentially, that is part of the designation that helps us determine whether or not a company is fulfilling the rules to be a qualified retirement plan uh, company. There are several different kinds of plans. There are what are referred to as deferred contribution plans. We'll talk about this in a second. There are defined benefit plans. And then there are plans that are combinations of those that uh, have pieces that are defined benefit and part of them that are defined contribution plans. So that's the basic structure, if you will, of retirement planning. All retirement plans have rules. Um, there's a participation requirement. You have to be at least 21 years old and one year of employment to be covered. That doesn't mean that you can be 18. Your company can choose that. But as a minimum requirement, if you're 21 and you've worked there for a year, you have to be covered. If the company offers something called immediately vesting, immediate vesting, then two years might be required. There are coverage requirements. This talks about how the benefits are actually distributed. And it's a fairly complicated process, but basically it says, look, there's a ratio test. The percentage of non-highly compensated employees, right, is at least 70% of the highly compensated employees that are covered. So how many are non-highly compensated employees? What is the highly compensated? You divide those and come up with 70%. The benefits test looks at the benefit paid. The, the, uh, you have to benefit the non-highly compensated employees as a percentage of compensation compared to the highly compensated employees. So there's, again, a, a number that you have to meet there. And then in the end, for defined benefit plans, there is a minimum participation test. It outlines essentially how many people have to participate for this plan to meet the coverage rules um, of, uh, of the, the pension programs. There are vesting requirements. How long do you have to work at the company until the company's contributions belong to you? Immediate vesting is what is frequently offered as soon as you start working and as soon as the company makes contributions they belong to you but in companies that have lots of, of, of turnover companies may want to kind of um, do a little risk assessment here right if we do full vesting at the end of five years in other words you have to work here for five years and at the end of five years everything we've contributed and everything moving forward will all be your money. A little bit less dramatic than that is a graduated one where every year is 20%. So at the end of the first year, 20% of the company's contributions now belong to you. Now, of course, your money earns money. Your money was input. It's obviously yours. That's yours. 
but now 20% of your company's money belongs to you. And the next year, they do another calculation, and it's 40%, and so on and so on. So at the end of five years, all of the company's um, contributions now belong to you, as well as, obviously, all of its growth. There are rules set in place that determines how much and when the company has to put money into the plan. Um, you would think it would be on a monthly basis, but for some of the smaller company programs, the requirement it is once a year. So you may not necessarily be getting um, monthly types of contributions or dollar cost averaging contributions uh, into your retirement plan for very small company plans. Um, however, the guidelines do indicate that wherever this money goes, it has to be liquid, it has to be diversified, and in general has to it has to be conservative without any undue risks. So this again is retirement money. So it has a, a different kind of an investment strategy, if you will, of, of what things companies can use uh, in order to uh, save money for their employees. So what kind of plans do we have? Typically there are two plans. A defined, defined contribution plan means that the employee contribution is typically a percentage. The employer contribution is also a percentage of compensation. So you know how much goes into the plan. You, it has a defined contribution. You know what goes in. What you don't know is how much will be there when you leave. So in the end, we have... Um, uh, the uncertainty of the future. Now, defined benefit plans are the typical um, pension plans of some of the larger corporations, like in the auto industry, et cetera, where the, the company puts money in, and you really don't know how much money goes in, but in the end, there is a defined benefit that you receive. Typically, it's based on what your income is the last three years that you work in a place. There are hybrids. The target benefit plans are hybrid programs where they combine bits and pieces of each one of these types of programs. 